Right. Good to have all of you. Amen. To make yourself right at home. If you're visiting with us, you're certainly welcome. Glad to have you here. Amen. I got to get my windage and elevation side alignment before I preach into this thing. Amen. All right. And to you turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number eleven. Mark eleven. As you know, this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, thank the good Lord for for what it represents. But all this week, if you're not aware of this, if the uh, the Protestant and Catholic Church and Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox, both Greek and Armenian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all the rest of them. Uh, I'll back up on that just a little bit. Uh, I think the Greek Orthodox Church celebrates Easter at a different date than the standard calendar date. I'm not certain of that, but I'm pretty sure they do. But this week, the Roman Catholic Church and Protestant churches uh, have what they call Holy Week. And uh, this coming Friday will be called Good Friday. And I'm sure you've heard that all your life, been raised up with that. That's become part of, uh, of the American culture and tradition. And the indication is that Christ was crucified on Friday and that he uh, rose from the dead on Sunday. Well, they're half right. He rose from the dead on Sunday. Let's study the rest of it tonight. And let's look at the Bible and see what it has to say about this because it's a very important thing. When did he die? What day of the week was he crucified on? Let's see if we can find out. In the book of Mark, chapter number 11, verse 1, Mark and Matthew mention the hours leading up to the crucifixion of Christ, number them, and the days. And uh, if you'll notice what it says here, that uh, this is the fourth day before the Passover, and it says in the book of Mark, chapter number 11, and verse 1, when they came nigh to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, said, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never man set, loose him, bring him. And if any man say to you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. So we read here where the Lord told them, that uh, to go find a colt. And if you'll notice what happens here in chapter number 11, and uh, the scripture says that uh, they found the colt and brought it, and then the Lord enters in to Jerusalem, and he comes riding in, if you'll notice what it says, in verse number 7, they brought the colt to Jesus, cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them, in the way, and cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save now. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the Lord triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. And this is the last week of his life on this earth when he comes into Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, his whole ministry was focused on Jerusalem and upon that last week, because that would be when he offered himself up as a sacrifice for your sins. If you'll notice, it says in verse number 11, he entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he went into this temple, he looked around and observed what was going on in the temple. Luke ch tells us in chapter number 19 and verse number 41, he beheld the city and wept over it when he came in to Jerusalem. He enters into the city riding a colt, donkey. And the Bible says that he looked over the city and he wept over it. And he says in Luke chapter number 19, verse 41, He wept and said, If thou hast known even at least in this thy day the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. He had to deal with a very religious people, but a very ignorant people. And it's amazing how religion does blind to the truth. This is the 11th day of Nisan. 
the fourth day before the Passover. This is our sunset, Saturday sunset to Sunday at sunset. It's very important to understand that the day with the Jew begins at sunset to the following sunset, and which would put it about 6 p.m. And so therefore the counting of time is from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., from 9 to midnight, from midnight till 3, and then from 3 until 6 in the morning. That's very important to understand because it will give you the hour that he was crucified. And it's dated from, it's measured from that counting of time. So he comes into Jerusalem, and he comes riding into Jerusalem, and he comes in on Saturday, on sunset, and uh, to the Sunday at sunset. On the third day before the Passover, which would be the twelfth day of Nisan, this would be on Sunday sunset to Monday sunset, he curses the fig tree. Now, this is not all that he does, but just a few of the things that he does to give you an idea of what transpires. Matthew 21, verse 19. He has come in to the city. And in Matthew chapter number 21 and verse 19, when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing. And he said, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. In Luke chapter number 19, verse number 45, he goes into the temple and this time he cleanses it. In Luke chapter number 19 and verse number 45, we read, And he went into the temple and began to cast them that sold therein, and them that bought, he cast them out. And he said, Do not make his father's house a house of merchandise. In verse 46 he said, It is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. So he cleanses the temple. This is the third day before the Passover, the twelfth day of Nisan. Nisan is the first month of the Jewish calendar. And it is the beginning of months, as God told them when he instituted the Passover, all the way back in the book of Exodus when Israel was in Egyptian bondage. The second day before the Passover, which will be the 13th of Nisan, our Monday sunset to Tuesday sunset. In the book of Mark, chapter number 11 and verse number 20, you'll find the scripture says this. Mark, chapter number 11 and verse 20. You'll notice that he curses the fig tree in Matthew 21. Here in Mark, chapter number 11, he teaches about it. In Mark, chapter number 11 and verse number 20. Mark 11, verse 20. And in the mornings they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou curseth is withered away. Now I want you to notice the 11th chapter of Mark. How many chapters does Mark have? It's got 16. All right. From the 11th chapter of Mark all the way through the rest of the book, it is dealing with the passion of Christ. A bo a, the book, Mark, only has 16 chapters. Over one-third of the entire book is dedicated to the last few days of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Passion, to the coming into Jerusalem, and to His final hours. So therefore, as far as Mark was concerned, what he was writing was very important about the last few days of the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls the hours, as Matthew does, and tells you when this happened. So in Mark chapter number 11 and verse number 20, In the morning they passed by, saw the fig tree. Peter calling, saith unto him, A master, the fig tree, which thou curseth, is withered away. Jesus answered, said to him, Have faith in God. For verily I say to you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And this is a very powerful thing, and nothing has changed. I pray with people a lot of times, and in my heart I feel like they don't a bit more believe God's going to do anything for them than a man in the moon. I just feel the unbelief. I just feel it. And, of course, I don't say anything about that. I'm not God. That's not my place to judge them. But some people you think, you would think, uh, my goodness, the last person on earth, and yet they're the ones that God heals. And you see the power of God move. You see God do things. You have seen so many things happen in this church. 
You cannot deny it. You cannot deny it. Amen. Therefore I say to you what things wherever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, Amen. and you shall have them. Yep. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. You have an unforgiving heart. You have a hard heart. You have a selfish heart. And that kind of heart grieves the Holy Ghost because the prayer must be made through the Holy Spirit in order to reach the Lord. In Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 23, he teaches in the temple. We won't read all the scriptures. I just want to give you these as a kind of a chronology to show you the many things. These are just a few of the things that he did. But in Matthew chapter number 21 and verse number 23, Matthew called your attention to the fact that when he was come to the temple, the chief priests, elders, the people came to him as he was teaching, said, By what authority doest thou these things? Who gave you your authority? And who gave thee this authority? I mean, who do you think you are pastoring a church? Well, God called me to preach. Well, you didn't, uh, you didn't uh, get approval of the synod. You didn't call upon the religious hierarchy. You didn't pay your dues. You didn't sign up with the organization. <laughs> That's what they did with uh, uh, Brother uh, Whit, uh, Whit, uh, what's his name? Whit's, uh, uh, I can't think of his last name. And he was such a, Whitson? No, it wasn't Whitson. What? Whitfield. Whitfield. He, they, they, uh, they wouldn't They would ordain him, and so he went out into the fields and started preaching. Great crowds gathered around him, and they said, Mr. Whitfield, we won't ordain you. He said, no, thank you. No, thank you. He said, this is my parish. This is my church. God did the ordaining. And that's exactly the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. If you base your ministry on man's approval, forget it. Don't ever base your ministry on man's approval or acceptance. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 24, he gives the prophecy of the Mount of Olives. And you've read that time and again. Chapter 1, verses 50, uh, chapter 24, verses 1 through 51. This is teaching that he gave right before he was crucified. This was some of the last teaching the Lord gave. And he gave teaching on the second advent, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the 14th day, or the day before the Passover, which is called the preparation day. This would be the 14th day of Nisan. Our Tuesday sunset to Wednesday sunset. We come down to the last few moments the Lord spent on this earth. I personally believe that the Lord's Supper was held on Tuesday evening after 6 p.m. The Lord's Supper, prior to the actual Passover meal itself, which would have been the next day. This is why they said this is a high holy day, referring to that Thursday. That Thursday would have been a Passover. The following day, Friday, would have been a Sabbath day. The following day, Saturday, was the weekly Sabbath. So you had three Sabbath days in a row coming up. And the Jews wanted him off the cross, and they wanted it all finished and done. So Tuesday evening, the Lord gathers together his disciples in the upper room, which was the 14th day of Nisan. And the Word of God says in the book of Exodus to keep up for 14 days a lamb, Observe whether it be without spot or blemish and offer it up to the Lord. Fourteen days of the first month of the year the Lord Jesus Christ had been kept up. No one ever found any fault in Him. Only a blind religionist could ever accuse Him. As a matter of fact, I don't know that He was ever accused by a secular authority. The only accusations that I can remember reading against the Lord Jesus, and if I'm wrong, somebody... Show me. But the only accusations that were ever brought against him were brought by religious figures, Amen. not by the secular authorities. The secular authorities, of course, uh, carried through with the crucifixion, but he was delivered up by the Jews. Amen. And Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Amen. Find no fault in him. Herod says, I don't want him. Send him to Pilate. I want to get rid of him. And uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was certainly condemned by religion. So the 14th day of Nisan, the preparation day, is Tuesday sunset to Wednesday sunset. Matthew 26, verse 17, records the last or the preparation for the last supper. We find them in all four Gospels. In Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 17, 
We are preparing for the Last Supper. It's very important. All, they want you to know about the Last Supper. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to Him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? So what was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread? You go back to the book of Leviticus, and all you have to do is trace it, find it, and it's very clear. Because the Feast of Unleavened Bread had within it the Passover. The Feast of Unleavened Bread had within its days the Passover meal. And so the Lord Jesus Christ meets with His disciples on Tuesday. It says in John chapter number 13, verses 1 through 20, it tells you about the Lord's Supper. In John chapter number 13, verses 1 through 20. It's called the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper or the... Or, uh, the uh, 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 I don't, you may some refer to it as the Last Passover because none count after that. <laughs> but the Lord Jesus Christ met with them in John 13, verses 1 through 20. Luke chapter number 22, verse 1, Judas Iscariot betrays him. He betrays him that very night. So if you want to look at a weekly calendar, it was on Tuesday night that Judas Iscariot, according to Luke chapter 22, verse 1, betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 26, verse 30, he goes to Gethsemane. Gethsemane means uh, olive press. And it was a place that the Scripture says he was wont to go to. In plainer words, he went there all the time. He used to pray beneath the old olive tree. And we've got some songs in our songbooks about the old olive tree. Beautiful. That's where he prayed. Can you imagine sitting up there in the dark and listening to him pray under the olive tree? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the opportunities that these disciples missed if they didn't go? and just kind of steal away in the darkness and listen to Him pray. In John 17, you have a prayer, and uh, the Lord record, or John records that prayer in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. It's a wonderful prayer, and you can, it's an intercessory prayer. He prays for His disciples. But uh, I, I can't help but believe that when He got under the olive trees, ancient olive trees, He poured His soul out to God, and that's where He went to the night that he was betrayed. One of his own was gone now to sell him to the religious, the head, the religious figures. And it was there that he went. He didn't run. He wasn't hiding. He, the Bible said he was wont to go there. Plain words, they knew he'd be there. They, Judas Iscariot knew where to find him. He knew exactly where to look for him. He knew he'd be there. He, didn't, he knew he didn't have to hunt him down. He wouldn't be running for his life. No, 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 no. Anybody ever tells you Jesus Christ ran for his life doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll never buy that. Never. Never, never, and I've heard it said, and I will not accept that. He never ran for his life. He said, I came to lay my life down and give it a ransom for many. So I've been under those old olive trees. God's blessed me and given me that opportunity to be there. And I've prayed under the old olive trees. You go to various places, you'll, also, you'll, you'll always notice the atmosphere. There is an atmosphere at Gethsemane that's different from anywhere. We had a meeting one time right across the street uh, from the olive trees. It's an extension of the gardens on the other side of the street. We went in there, and some young ladies were sitting in there with notepads and Bibles. And they were uh, members of a Bible college, and they'd come, and they were taking notes and meditating. And we said, do you care if we have a meeting here? Oh, no, we don't mind it at all. So they just joined in with us. And we had a service right there next to the old olive trees. My, 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 what a meeting we had next to the old olive trees. Where he prayed, we prayed. There's something about that, folks. Those trees, there's one that's close to the gate. You can it's close to the fence. In other words, you can touch it. And uh, the, the bark of a tree is a pretty strong thing, but they have literally worn the bark off by rubbing that, touching it, praying, pouring their heart out, calling upon God by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who come by there daily uh, you know, it, it, uh, not that many in one day, but um, they're coming by daily. They've rubbed it, rubbed it, rubbed it, and rubbed it. You'll never be, you'll never be disappointed with Gethsemane. And that's where he went on the night before his crucifixion. It, has, it is night now, and he is in Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter number 26, verse 47, that's where they apprehend him. They apprehend him at Gethsemane. Matthew chapter number 26, verse 47. 
Then in uh, that night they took him from Gethsemane, and they took him, and it was the night of trials. In Matthew 26, 57, Mark 14, 53, Luke 22, 54, and John 18, 12, the Lord Jesus Christ endures mock trials that night. He's being tried at the hands of man, passed from one to the other, back to the one. And throughout that night, he's tried, he's placed in confinement. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Mark 15, verse 25. Turn there with me and we'll read what Mark says. Remember what I told you about Mark. He gives you times. He's interested in times. He spends over a third of his gospel just dealing with the last few moments of the Lord Jesus Christ's life on this earth. In Mark chapter number 15 and verse number 25. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. So what time would that be? It was the third hour of the day, not of the night now. It would be nine o'clock in the morning. And the night is measured up in four watches. First watch of the night, second watch of the night, <clears throat> third watch of the night, fourth watch of the night. You remember what watch of the night it was when he came walking on the sea? It was the fourth watch of the night. It was the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch of the night. He came, he came walking on the sea. So at nine o'clock in the morning, they nailed him on a cross. He hadn't slept all night. He'd been passed, passed from one mock trial to another. And uh, it was at nine in the morning. This was 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning. This is Wednesday. It would have been 9 o'clock this morning on a Wednesday that they nailed him on the tree. Now, I firmly believe that. I don't believe in Good Friday. I do not believe Good Friday has anything to do with the crucifixion of Christ. <clears throat> I believe Good Friday is a creation of religion. But I do believe that on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, the Lord Jesus was nailed on the cross. The Bible says, Mark says it was the third hour. Now, Matthew gives you the hours again, too. Matthew chapter number 27, verse 45. Matthew wants, to know the, he wants you to know the hours. Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 45. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So what time would that be? If the third hour is at nine in the morning, when would the sixth hour be? It would be 12 o'clock noon. All right. <clears throat> the term post-meridian means past. It's height. So uh, 1 p.m. is 1 post-meridian. 1 p.m. post-meridian. In plain words, <clears throat> it's going down, see. It goes up. The, hot, the sun reaches its zenith, its highest point. Of course, that changes throughout the seasons of the year. But it reaches its highest point. Then it begins to descend. All right. So from the... Uh, the Scripture says here from... 12 p.m., 12 noon, the highest time, the, the brightest time of the day, it got dark. <laughs> it got dark. Instead of being the brightest time of the day, it got dark. And it was not an eclipse. Don't let any, any reprobate liberal, some liberal church man try to tell you some eclipse took place. It's not an eclipse. It's total darkness. It's darkness like they had in uh, Egypt. In the land, uh, there was one place in Egypt that wasn't dark. The rest of it was dark. And what wasn't dark? Goshen. That's why you've got a Goshen, Alabama, and a Goshen, Georgia, and a Goshen, Tennessee, and a Goshen. <laughs> you get a map sometime and look at some of the names on that map, and you'll find you'll be amazed at Bible names all over the country. You will be. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. But anyway... At 12 noon, it turned dark. And for the next three hours, they no longer could look upon him like they did before. They could only listen. They could only listen. They could listen. And Matthew tells you that at uh, Matthew chapter number 27 or 45, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So what time would that be? It would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. All right. Now, what time would the day end? 6 o'clock. So about, it was about a three-hour window between the time the Lord gave up the ghost at three in the afternoon and the ending of the day. Remember that. It's very important. The day does not end at midnight with a Jew. The day ends at, three, uh, uh, ends at 6 p.m. in the evening. It ends in the evening. 
Evening starts at 6 o'clock. 5 o'clock is afternoon. 5.45 is afternoon. 5.59 is afternoon. 6 p.m. is evening. And so the evening hour begins the new day. So for three hours, from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 6 o'clock in the afternoon, the Lord Jesus Christ, body, was dead. And they carried it to a virgin tomb. For three hours. For three hours. Now, they wanted him in that tomb before 6 o'clock. There's a reason I say there's a window. They wanted his body in the tomb before 6 and if they didn't have his body prepared, if they hadn't done enough, then they'd have to come back and do it later because uh, the high Sabbath began at 6 p.m. Not the Saturday Sabbath, the high Sabbath, the uh, Passover. And so at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he passed. He gave his, he gave, he gave his, gave his spirit to God, said, unto, unto thee I come in my spirit. And his body died. And they took his body down from the cross. And it didn't stay up there long. Because the Bible says that they came and break the bones of one on one side, one on the other side. Because of, the, because of this high and holy day coming up. They wanted to get this over with. But when they came to the Lord, what happened? He was dead already. And so to prove that he was dead, they rammed a spear into his side. Forthwith, the Bible said, came blood and water. And uh, standing there observing that was a Roman, hardened Roman soldier who looked up and saw that and listened to what this man had said for six hours. He listened to him for six hours. Six hours. He said, truly, this was the Son of God. He wasn't convinced that he was the Son of God by any miracle he performed. He was convinced he was the Son of God by who he was. And there's something about that. I mean, it's a different study altogether, but if you, if you, I've got the references. It didn't bring them with me tonight, but time again in the Gospel of Mark, the Lord Jesus Christ tells demons, you don't tell them who I am. He tells the witnesses to his miracles, you don't tell them who I am. He tells his disciples, you don't tell them who I am. It was after his resurrection, when he rose from the dead, that he's the living one. Then the word goes forth. This is who I am. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, does not base the essence of who he is so much on what he did in the miracles he performed. He based the essence of who he is on his resurrection from the dead. That's all important. Don't ever let anybody minimalize it. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead if He did not rise from the dead. If He only rose from the dead in spirit, in His message, in His influence, as the liberal teaches. But His body did not physically rise from the dead. The liberal will get up in his pulpit and say, Oh, His teachings are with us today. And His spirit is with us today. And the greatness and blah, blah, blah. Shut up. Either He arose from the dead or you're still in your sins. For the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ be not risen, then you are dead. You are dead. And your loved ones are dead. He based all of life of the future on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Based it all. There, there's no giving. There's no middle ground. There, there's, no, there's no mediation here. There's no, there's no arbitration. Either you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead bodily, well, that's it. Forget it. <laughs> You're not a Christian. You have no problem believing that with the Holy Ghost. If you've got the Holy Ghost in, you believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Amen. And, of course, you know, I went into the tomb over there in the garden. And it's a beautiful place. And I looked in there. And I can come back and tell you he wasn't there. But does that prove anything? <laughs> well, of course not. That doesn't prove anything at all. 2,000 years later... <laughs> But uh, I, you'd be amazed at how many people go into that tomb. I was in there with about uh, three or four other people. And uh, they walked in there, and this one woman looked over in the corner. And the guide said, that's where his body lay. Now, they don't know that for certain. We know, we're not absolutely 100% certain that the garden tomb is where the Lord was. We're not. It, it fits all the criteria. It's got, a, it's got a huge cistern underneath to hold water. It was a garden. It, has a, it had a tomb, a first century Jewish tomb, hewn out of the rock. 
It had a place there where the stone could be rolled. If you've ever been there, it, it, it fits good. And nearby is a rock formation that looks like a skull, Golgotha, and that the Bible said it's nearby. And a rich man owned the tomb and all that. It may very well, and I believe it is, but I wouldn't argue with somebody over that. But they walked in there, and she looked over in that corner, and she said, that's where he was. And boy, she busted out crying. And I'm telling you the truth, they started shouting and bawling and crying and jumping up and down. <laughs> because there wasn't anybody in that tomb. <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> that's all good. <laughs> but it makes me wonder, were they planning on finding somebody in there? You know, I mean, <clears throat> you're talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago. Amen. Amen. I mean, it had been very a simple matter to steal somebody's body away 2,000 years ago. You don't prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ by an empty tomb today. You prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ by a number of factors. Number one, the witness of the Holy Spirit to the fact that He's alive. Number two, if the Jews had His body, you'd know about it. If the Jews could have produced the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the New Testament would have died de facto. That would have been it. It had been over with. That would have been it. They couldn't produce his body. They couldn't find him. Why? Because his body wasn't dead. <laughs> Amen. They paid huge sums to lie about it. They paid huge sums of money to lie about it. To this day in the Babylonian Talmud, in the Mishnah, and all the rest of the Jewish writings, they lie through their teeth that he was a usurper and an imposter and blah, blah, and they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, but they cannot for one moment they can have not a. Sh We've got all kinds of proof that he's alive. Amen. 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 I never was much at worshiping a dead man, and I don't worship a dead man now. You're not worshiping a dead man. If Jesus Christ is dead, well, you've got no God. Amen. He's alive. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. So, at uh, according to Mark chapter number fifteen, and verse number thirty-four, here's what Mark says. If you've noticed now, it should become very obvious to you that Matthew and Mark run uh, uh, together a lot on the narrative of the life of Christ. Mark chapter 15, verse 34. This is why the liberals say that Mark was first and then Matthew copied Mark. You get that when you get into higher criticism. Mark chapter 15, verse number 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Now what time would this be? Three o'clock, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You thought it was dark for six hours. That was the darkest moment in eternity. Right there. That was the darkest. That was it. It can't get any darker than that because the Almighty had turned his back on his son. Amen. Amen. And Christ had lived by the Father every moment, every breathing moment in this world. He had lived by the Father. He had lived by this fellowship and communion and strength of the Father. He came to do the Father's will. And the Father turned his back on him. So his body was placed in the tomb before 6 o'clock Wednesday evening. So let's count the days and nights. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's what he said. Not a half a day. Not as the Jews count a half a day. But let's count them. Wednesday night is one night. Thursday night is two nights. Friday night is three nights. Thursday is one day. Friday is two days. Saturday is three days. That gives us three days and three nights. So when did he rise from the dead? Well, this is the part right here that uh, uh, probably you'll, 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 you, may, you, you may find it very controversial. Remember when the day starts in the Jewish? Jewish? Anytime after 6 p.m. evening. See, the day starts. How, do, how so? All right. Go back to the book of Genesis and read it. How does God measure the days there? The evening and the morning were what? See how the Almighty did it? The Jews said, well, if the Lord does it that way, we'll do it that way. Am I going to find fault with them? It's like when the Hebrew, he writes from right to left. English writes from left to right. Which one's right? Well, he was writing from right to left long before we ever wrote from left to right. Amen. We're Johnny come latelys. Hebrew and Arabic and some other Semitic languages that write from right to left showed up a whole lot longer before we did. 
All right. So we, we, we have no problem having three days and three nights. Anytime after 6 p.m. Saturday. But what does that put then? What do we got? If it is after 6 p.m. Saturday, what is ending after 6 p.m. Saturday? The Sabbath. The Sabbath is ending. And what's starting? First day of the week. So the first day of the week in the Jewish calendar starts after 6 p.m. Saturday evening. All right? That's the first day of the week. Now, we Gentiles, if it's 11 o'clock Saturday night, we think it's Saturday. But according to God, it's Sunday. Right? You could mess up a whole bunch of Sabbatarians like that. I'm telling you, I mean, wouldn't want to do it, but... Uh, the Apostle Paul said one man esteemeth one day above another, so forth and so on. But I mean, when you want to get technical about things, you could really get technical with the Seventh-day Adventist about that. Yeah. I think somebody did one time. They told me about it. They said they got with one. And, and there's a lot of, I think there's some saved Seventh-day Adventists. I'm not here to condemn these people. I'm just trying to give you something to let you understand. If you ever get so technical on something, you, you might get in trouble real fast. You know. And they're, they're, they're counting the Sabbath day according to the uh, Gentile calendar? I hope not. I hope not. If they're gonna, if they're gonna, in other words, if they're gonna hold to the Jewish Sabbath, you better hold to the Jewish Sabbath of keeping of time, right? Amen. Don't take the Jewish Sabbath and keep it by the Gentile time. Right. All right. Anyway, let's get back away from that rabbit and get back over here. Any time after six o'clock, he arose from the dead. Right. Would be the first day of the week. Now, by definition, the first day of the week is also which day of the week? Well, it's Sunday. We call it Sunday. Notice the New Testament doesn't give it any name like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It just calls it the day of the week. Why doesn't it do that? There's a couple of reasons, but the main reason. What's the main reason why the New Testament doesn't call Sunday Sunday? It just calls it the first day of the week. Saul, S-O-L, Saul is the sun god. So they named a day after him. Sunday. So if an atheist or an agnostic jumps all over you and says, well, you don't even know why you're calling Sunday, Sunday, so you call it whatever you want to. It's the first day of the week. You see, Sunday is purely pagan, the name is. All the days of the week, the naming of the days of the week are pure pagan, just like the names of the, day, of the months are pagan. It's all pagan. So why do you use them so people don't know what I'm talking about? So we can communicate. You see, that's why Paul said, when I'm with the Romans, I do as the Romans do. When I'm with the Greeks, I do as they do. He said, I'll accommodate their ignorance and go right along with them. That's exactly what he said. He said, you've got, a, you've got an image right here to the unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. That's what he meant by that. You're not being a smart aleck or arrogant or anything like that, but it's good to know. It's the eighth day. It's not only the first day, but when God begins to count, what, does he, what would it be? It would have to be the eighth day also. See? It would also be the eighth day. And the number eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. And the gematria, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, the numerical value of His name, Jesus, is eight, eight, eight. Amen. The number of the Antichrist is six, six, six. Amen. That double spiral helix that the brother was talking about the other night, six feet long. I thought, man, that's quite a coincidence. How come? Because six is stamped all over man. Amen. Right? Six. All right, how many hours did he hang on the cross? Six. Why? Because he's man. He's the God man. He's the, he's the perfect man. He's, he's, he's the representation of all mankind. He's the man, Christ Jesus, dying for your sins. So he hangs there for six hours. There's something unique about his death, though, that's different from anybody else. In the third, in the, in the, in the sixth hour at three o'clock in the afternoon, sixth hour on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, therefore, did he die from the nail prints or from the thorn or from the loss of blood? Or how did he die? He gave his life. Yeah, absolutely, brother. He gave himself for us, see? That gives, that, you see, if he had died as a result of what had happened to him, that had been wonderful. But it would not have had the impact of him giving. In plain words, in complete control 
to his last breath. Amen. I read about these two people been married for 60 years. I read about this in the New Sentinel about a month ago. And I thought, I think it was the Sentinel. Anyway, they'd been married something like 60 years. She passed away. They told him, said, your wife's gone. Well, he knew she was dying. And he immediately went into a, a the, the term was a debilitating physical state. He was dead within a few hours. The nurses and the doctors said this is absolutely beyond understanding how that he could just die like that after his wife had died. But of course he gave up the will to live, didn't want to live, wanted to leave this world. And uh, when he breathed his last, it's when Almighty took his spirit. But when the Lord Jesus breathed his last, it's when he offered up his spirit. The Bible said, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, Amen. thou shalt see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Amen. Can you imagine that when he looked up into the face of the Father after six hours on the cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, I can go no further. There is no more that can be done. I have perfected what had to be done. And the Father agreed. And he received his son. Amen. Amen. So, we Christians, we who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that they took his body and laid it in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's what the Bible says. And according to the scriptures, nobody had ever been in that tomb before. Now, back in those days, it was not uncommon at all to lay a body in a tomb. Let it lay there for about a year. Go back and collect the bones of that body and put them in what's called an ossuary. They have found a couple of ossuaries that date back to the first century. One of them even has the words Caiaphas on the side of it. So it's obvious that Mr. Caiaphas, the high priest, died. They collected his bones and put them in the ossuary. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't stay in there long enough for that. The Apostle Peter got up in Acts chapter number 2 and says, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. If his body had laid there for a year, it wouldn't have corrupted. After three days, they went to the tomb of Lazarus. And the sister said, Now, Master, he stinketh. So only after three days, he'd already begun to decay. But the body of the Lord Jesus Christ arose three days after it was placed in the tomb just as pure, just as perfect, just as clean, and without sin. Glory to God. And when he walked out of that tomb, he walked out of there, the God-man, resurrected from the dead into a whole new world. And he's the source of it, the Lord God of it, and the future for every one of us tonight. Victor over death, hell, and the grave. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so everybody will get together Sunday and they'll celebrate the resurrection of Christ. That's all fine. But the next Sunday I'm going to get together and I'm going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And the following Sunday I'm going to get together and I'm going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Because the first day of the week is indelibly stamped with the resurrection of Christ. After 6 o'clock on Saturday evening, he came forth from the dead. When did he come forth? Nobody can prove when. There's no sense trying to nail some hour down. He came up any time after 6 o'clock Saturday evening. He arose from the dead. Probably, you know, if you want to be a little mystical about it, he could be standing on top of the Mount of Olives. And just before the sun came up, he said, Rise, son. <laughs> because he was alive from the dead. This time he tells the sun when to rise. Because he's the Lord God now that was dead and liveth forever. Hallelujah, folks. Amen. That's the bedrock of our faith. Amen. If Christ is not risen, then we're dead in our sins and our faith is in vain and your loved ones are dead and gone. You'll never see them again. It's all over with. Amen. But brother, he's alive. Yes, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use this lesson tonight for the glory of God. And bless the name of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Bless his holy name.
In Jesus' name, bless the name of Jesus. In Jesus' sweet name, I pray. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. Hallelujah. And amen. Amen.